Welcome to a quick discussion of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. As a sequel to one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time, this game had a lot to live up to. So, now that I've finished it, I want to share my thoughts. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was a monumental release for a multitude of reasons. It drastically redesigned the series' gameplay by making it open world, or as the developers called it, open air. The risk paid off though because it's currently the highest selling Zelda game of all time at around 30 million copies at the time of this recording, and it has a 97 out of 100 on Metacritic. It also influenced the world design of other open world games, so because of its enduring legacy, there were a lot of concerns about where the series could even go after Breath of the Wild. When Tears of the Kingdom was first announced, there was a lot of skepticism because we have the same versions of Link, Zelda, and Hyrule itself. Because the joy of Breath of the Wild is so interlinked to the sense of exploration and discovery, People were wondering if this game would have the same impact by going back to the same world that we're already somewhat familiar with. Having finished Tears of the Kingdom, I think this exceeds Breath of the Wild in almost every possible way. I think this might be one of my favorite Zelda games of all time, and possibly one of my favorite games, period. I thoroughly enjoyed this game, and even if you didn't enjoy Breath of the Wild, you might still want to try this out at some point, because it actually might fix some of your problems with Breath of the Wild. Obviously, some of the biggest issues people had with Breath of the Wild were the durability system for weapons, and climbing in the rain, and the overall sparseness of the world, and things of that nature. But a lot of these have actually been alleviated through various means. So for example, with weapon durability, we can actually use a new ability to get around it a little bit. So for example, we can use an ability called Fuse to attach various items to weapons, which actually powers up the weapons and in a lot of cases gives them a little bit of extra durability. We also have another new ability called Ultra Hand, which allows you to pick up and attach objects to each other like so, in order to solve puzzles and to navigate the environment. The fundamental gameplay is relatively unchanged though, so for example the combat is basically the same, we have a lot of returning enemies, but we do have a lot of new enemies as well, like the Zonai constructs. In general, enemy variety was another major issue with Breath of the Wild, and while it's not perfect, it's still a lot better in Tears of the Kingdom. I still would have liked to see a few more classic enemies to be honest, but overall it is a definite improvement over the previous game. We still have a lot of physics interactions as well, so you might have noticed gusts of wind caused by the fire, and with the new Ultra Hand move, I feel like this really complements the physics system well. So for example, you might be able to find parts for a sailboat, and then you can build one and use the wind to sail across a body of water. You can build a flying machine, and you basically have to stand on certain parts of it in order to get it to turn or tilt. It's a very robust physics system, and kind of like with Breath of the Wild, but even on a greater scale, I question how this even works at all, especially on the Switch of all platforms, which at this point is a six-year-old handheld console hybrid, and yet the physics are so robust and competent in a way that really surprises me. For example, I've actually seen very few physics glitches, or glitches period really, in terms of issues I've had the only real problem is obviously the performance. You might notice a couple of frame drops throughout this video. In general, I think it's still a little bit more stable than Breath of the Wild, but it's still not a locked 30 FPS. The resolution is also relatively comparable as well, though there is Fidelity Super Resolution or FSR to bump up the resolution a little bit from its native resolution. I also feel like other 
aspects like the draw distance have also been improved ever so slightly, but in general, it's a very similar experience to Breath of the Wild in terms of overall visual quality and performance. I will say certain areas that did cause problems in Breath of the Wild actually do run considerably better in Tears of the Kingdom, but in cases like using Ultra Hand in areas with dense foliage or weather effects, the frame rate can definitely take a massive hit, so be aware of that. So yeah, we built a little sailboat here. The wind is actually going the opposite way though, so it won't actually help us out here, but just as a demonstration. We also have another really cool ability called Ascend, which lets you actually go through objects like this. In a game with this much verticality, Ascend is a very helpful ability, and frankly, it's just really cool to just be able to phase through a ceiling. We also have Rewind, which allows you to basically rewind an object in motion. So for example, there'll be enemy encampments where they'll send a giant spiked ball rolling down a hill, and you can use Rewind to send it back at them, basically. The new powers are all really cool. I will admit I wish they had also kept the old powers as well, even though in a lot of cases the other powers weren't super helpful. So for example, Ultra Hand giving you the ability to pick up various objects is kind of like Magnesis but applies to more things, but I will also say that it has a shorter range than Magnesis. And we have Recall or rewind, yeah, it's recall, that actually will temporarily pause an object before it starts moving back. It sort of works a little bit like stasis in that regard, but the one power-up I really miss is remote bombs. Because of how finite resources are in both games, having infinite bombs was very helpful, albeit a little bit overpowered, I'll admit. So I understand why they made bombs a finite resource again. Basically, you can find bomb flowers throughout the environment. We also can throw various materials as well and equip them to arrows similar to using fuse. So in general, instead of using various elemental weapons, you basically make your own using fuse. So you don't have fire or ice arrows, you just basically take a fire fruit and an arrow and you'll have the same effect. Similarly, you don't have fire rods or ice rods, instead you basically just attach certain elemental items to a standard weapon. So you can basically take various like gems, like rubies for example, attach them to a weapon and they'll add a fire attribute to it. It's a very unique system to build off of the elemental properties of Breath of the Wild. In general, I'm just so impressed by how much this game actually manages to build off of the first game, given that Breath of the Wild was such a groundbreaking game at the time, and yet somehow Tears of the Kingdom feels so much more expansive and fleshed out by comparison. But yeah, depending on what you didn't like about Breath of the Wild, this game might not have changed enough to change your mind in terms of durability, for example. Other areas have also been alleviated quite a bit, including things like climbing in the rain, which there's now materials that you can cook to give you items that give you slip resistance. So that's another improvement to a major issue in Breath of the Wild. Another recurring complaint about Breath of the Wild was the enemy variety, and this game does a slightly better job, but I do feel like it's still a little bit lacking in some ways. I kind of wish there were a few more classic enemies and new enemies, but in general it's still way better than Breath of the Wild. Another really big complaint, of course, was the Divine Beasts, and how they weren't necessarily a good replacement for traditional dungeons, and this game actually does have something closer to traditional dungeons while trying to kind of keep a lot of the concepts of the Divine Beasts. In general, I actually did like the, the dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom, but I also like the Divine Beasts, so I'm not the best judge of that. But I do like these better than the Divine Beasts in 
Breath of the Wild. You still have a ton of shrines as well, and after completing four shrines, you get enough items to upgrade your stamina or health, like in Breath of the Wild, so a lot of the fundamental systems are still in place. In general, another major change to Tears of the Kingdom is evident as soon as the Great Sky Island, which basically acts as the equivalent to the Great Plateau from Breath of the Wild. Compared to the Great Plateau, the Great Sky Island feels a lot more linear. Basically, you'll get a power like in Breath of the Wild, and that'll let you get to the next shrine. So instead of having this wide open plane where you can basically go to a bunch of shrines out of order, you basically have a set order, and that reflects on how the overall structure of Tears of the Kingdom is. It's still a very open-ended game, but there is slightly more linearity to it compared to Breath of the Wild, and actually, I like that better. I almost feel like Breath of the Wild is a little too open at times, and that comes at the cost of things like the storytelling and characters. Tears of the Kingdom still struggles a little bit with some things in terms of being able to do things out of order, and how a game that can be done out of order has to be structured, but in general, it feels a lot more cohesive. For example, a lot of items that you'd get early on in Breath of the Wild are actually tied to completing certain main story quests, so you actually are encouraged a lot more to go through the main story. Characters also push you in a specific direction a lot more. So in Breath of the Wild, you had the four divine beasts, and there were sort of indications of taking care of one first, but Tears of the Kingdom, by comparison, definitely feels like it is deliberately trying to encourage you to complete the main areas in a specific order, which does give it a slightly different feeling. In a lot of ways, the structure of this reminds me a little bit of A Link Between Worlds, and there are other comparisons to past Zelda games as well as we approach the surface. I had a really weird experience when I first landed in Hyrule. I just played Breath of the Wild in terms of the main story, all the shrines, and the DLC because I needed footage for the review for the base game and the expansion pass review that should hopefully be coming out by the end of next month. Despite having just played Breath of the Wild, I still got extremely turned around when I first landed in Hyrule. It didn't feel familiar for some reason, and that's because a lot of the landscape has actually changed. And I also feel like it's because the area you drop in, which is basically Central Hyrule Field, is not an area you stick around in very long because you don't want to be shot by a guardian or three. So because of that, I feel like it's actually a really good idea dropping you in an area that you probably didn't spend much time in because it's extraordinarily dangerous. You still have some enemies around the Great uh, or around Hyrule Field, but in general, you actually do get to see a little bit more of it at a more leisurely pace because you don't have to worry about a ton of enemies around the castle area. In general, I really like how this game takes what Breath of the Wild set up and just inverts and subverts certain elements of that to create what feels like a fairly fresh experience. You will end up seeing various landmarks that are very recognizable, but in general, it does surprise me how different the world feels. In a lot of cases, it sort of felt uncanny sometimes, like almost like an uncanny valley having just played Breath of the Wild. Like, I was just here in the other game, why doesn't this feel right? And that actually is a very nice feeling, even though the world is still relatively unchanged. The majority of the world is still very intact, it's just a few details here and there that have been altered. But I do really like the exploration in Tears of the Kingdom. There have been a lot of very smart changes, including with the Ultra Hand ability and being able to craft various items to help you get around a little bit more easily. However, there is more to this than meets the eye. There's a whole other area to Tears of the Kingdom 
that is extremely expansive and shockingly was extremely undermarketed. For how sparse the marketing is, I'm amazed they didn't show this more. It was br briefly visible in a few directs, and that's about it. They never really officially talked about this, but you might notice that giant red void over there. Basically, you have a new substance called Gloom that gradually will train your health and actually make it so you can't recover health very easily. And in a lot of spots covered in Gloom, you can actually jump down into various chasms. These lead to a new section called the Depths. I really enjoyed this. It's very dark when you first land, and you basically have to use special fruits that illuminate the area in order to basically navigate everything here. You basically want to find various light routes like this to light up more of the area, but in the meantime, yeah, you basically have to toss um, bright blooms to light everything up. In a lot of ways, this can be compared obviously to the Dark World from A Link to the Past and A Link Between Worlds, but honestly, it actually reminded me a lot of Subrosia of all things, from the Oracle games, specifically Oracle of Seasons. I actually looked it up, and the current director for the Zelda series, Hitamaro Fujibayashi, actually did work at Capcom, and did work on a lot of those Capcom Zelda games, including the Oracle games. So part of me wonders if that was a deliberate like choice to kind of have an underground area kind of comparable to Sabrosha. But having an entirely separate underworld essentially that basically is sort of like a dark mirror to Hyrule is fascinating. The game is so massive and it runs shockingly well as a Switch game. Again, sometimes when you drop like from the sky all the way through a chasm, sometimes the game will start to lag, but in general it is kind of remarkable how much they've been able to pull off on the Nintendo Switch. We also have a ton of collectibles, as you'd expect. We have the postals down here that are used to trade for items. We also have the return of Korok seeds. And we also have some new types of Korok quests as well, which involve basically taking one Korok who's lost to another Korok nearby. And in general, I feel like that will cut down the amount of time needed to collect the Koroks, because in a lot of cases, you'll get two, essentially, for quests like this. In general, I am very impressed with Tears of the Kingdom. I didn't have too many issues with Breath of the Wild, to be fair, that is still one of my favorite games of all time, and yet Tears of the Kingdom just iterates on basically almost everything I could possibly want to be fixed. There's still a few issues, and again, most of that involves the story structure and how you can basically do things out of order, and that basically means certain things have to be set up in a way that can sometimes feel a little bit awkward and clunky, but beyond that, I really like this game. I will say I would like to do an edited review for Tears of the Kingdom, but I have no ET on that. Obviously, I still need to do the expansion pass review, hopefully again by the end of next month. And after that, I think I will take a break because I will still be trying to 100% this game by then, and I'll want a break before trying to restart the game and gather the footage. But again, I do plan to eventually do like a full edited review style video for Tears of the Kingdom. So I highly recommend this game if you liked Breath of the Wild. Personally, it was absolutely worth it even as the first $70 Switch game, which is very steep, but because of how much content and how much I enjoyed Breath of the Wild, it is 100% worth it to me. For those who are on the fence who didn't like Breath of the Wild and are still kind of curious because of like the new physics systems with Ultra Hand and uh, Fuse, I would recommend waiting for a price drop, but possibly still giving it a chance eventually just because this game does address so many issues with Breath of the Wild. But again, not everything. So for example, if you're clamming for traditional dungeons, you might still be unimpressed with what Tears of the Kingdom has to offer. So it kind of depends on what problems stood out to you about Breath of the Wild. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this game. This will probably be one of my favorite games of the year, but we'll, uh, I'll probably include it in the end of the year video in a little bit more detail. But for now, I think that about covers everything I wanted to say about it, so thank you for watching, and I hope you'll join me next time for another discussion.